moved back to Ireland to pursue a career in art. Uh, the art business collapsed when the country collapsed in 2008 due to, ironically, a banking crisis. And I, so I said, this is a chance I have to write a book. I wrote a book called Puzzling People, The Labyrinth of the Psychopath, about psychopathology in socialized circumstances. These are psychopaths who operate in big businesses, mostly based on my, my experiences of Wall Street. And amazingly, what I did is a, a, to, to, as a part-time thing to keep me occupied while I was basically not making any money, it became a best-selling book. And it got me a, a big profile all over the world. And uh, from that point on, it gave me a career as a writer. A minor career as a writer, but it gave me that start. And uh, even in that book, I had mentioned things that were very much rooted in the occult. Things I spoke about the, the allegory of Lucifer being actually a kind of a cleansing agent against moral, against fake morality and these kinds of ideas, and what the uh, God of the Old Testament really represents. And it it horrified people, particularly in America, in the Bible Belt, who were shocked that I'd actually said that like, maybe Lucifer's the good guy in the story of things like Job and this kind of idea. And it was, I, I in, began slowly, my second book on psychopaths, I spoke about things like the Malia, the, the, sorry, the Malia, and other ideas of archetypal forces within various mythology and folklore that have been used to describe how the evil people that walk amongst us without using clinical psychology language supplemented, augmented with mythology and legend to show that these things have always been amongst us. And our ancestors, just like everything else, they may have not had the technical or the, shall we say, the scientific language to describe these forces, just like they didn't have them with nature, but they invented allegories, mythologies, archetypes to deal with it. And one of the things I came up with was the idea that you have you ever encountered an individual like this in your life with no contact ever again, complete banishment from your life? If they're draining the energy out of you, if they're torturing you, playing mind games with you, the way to deal with it is complete and utter amputation of them and their psychic force within your life. And that was the thing I called no contact ever again. But that directly came from a book I'd read on Slavic magic years ago, where it was kind of a banishment, a banishment spell, but it was like a proactive banishment spell where it wasn't so much you did a kind of a conjuration but it was kind of like a ritual like in some in like Croatian or in Serbia you would you would issue a, a statement I want nothing to do with you ever again and you would absolutely mean that absolutely cut them off and the idea was the energetic entanglement and when we talk a little bit about these kinds of things later on between you and that person was broken for all and, and the actual psychology of knowing this person is no longer ever going to harm me ever again was an incredibly liberating force especially when people started to write to me and they said that this person like it was an abusive boyfriend an abusive wife a boss who was tortured them and when you when the day that i told them at the day that they wrote to me or contacted me or met them in the street and i walked past them i suddenly felt i'd grown by six inches and this was very powerful. And it proved to me that these ideas rooted in ancient magic and sorcery, they absolutely are valid. And they're valid in the sense that they do work. They, whatever the foundation of sorcery and magic is, it's a proven, it's a proven process. A lot of it is just the vernacular, the language, and the way we think in a contemporary period. So, you know, you might have the sorcery in one particular culture or may have it in a kind of a psychology language but it doesn't matter and this is why you had people like Carl Jung and Joseph Campbell attempting to fuse both ideas together so I've always been I've always wanted to get around and I wrote a book on social engineering and then I slowly came out of the closet when I wrote a book about called Valpurgis Night and the book was about the, the occult history of the Third Reich written from a non-sensationalist point of view and I studied and went over to Germany quite a bit and got very interested in German folk magic and saw how the Third Reich had incorporated many of these ideas and neuroses within the population at the time and basically had hexed them. They had hexed them using a very ancient forms of mind control and magic which 
had been cultivated over the centuries, even after the Enlightenment. Things like Wagnerian operas. Wagnerian operas are very magical. And that each character that walks on the stage, they have their own particular theme tune. When they walk on the stage, when the Third Reich came along, when they had their Nuremberg rallies and so on, each member of the, the, the parliamentary aspect of the Third Reich would have their own particular, like Himmler would have a theme tune, and Gerbils would have a theme, Gerbils would have a theme tune, and uh, Rudolf Hess and so on. And I found that tremendously interesting because it worked. You can say all you want about the Nazis and say all you want about World War II, but their magical spell upon the German people absolutely worked. And the reason why it worked was because they tapped into the folk archetypes of the population and the people. They found the, the ghost in their soul, and then they hexed them. And that's exactly how a pathological individual gets into your life. They will find a, neuro a part of it you were abused as a child, if you had a bad divorce, if you went through a difficult stage in your life, if you're insecure about your looks, your weight, and so on, they will come in and they will repair. They will repair that ghost in your soul. So it was almost like these pathological in individuals, psychopaths, sociopaths, malignant narcissists, whatever you want to call them, they were almost instinctual black magicians because they would, they had, because they had no internal psychological structure of their own. They were able to find them in other people and play on them. And it was something that was very spooky was that, and this was like one of these kind of confirming ideas of the supernatural world for me, is that it was back in 2012, the New York Times, 2011, sorry, the New York Times reported on a center in Florida where 20-something psychopathic children under the age of seven had been diagnosed very early, by the way, uh, and were brought into a, a center and what they discovered was that they all had this instinctual ability to target, manipulate, mind control, and spellbind people. It's like it was, it was an eight. It was an eight, just like a mother knows how to breastfeed her child. Or it's, it was an eight. And so the, the thing became more frightening and kind of more darker for me. And so I, I've always been interested in the occult ever since I read, read David Conway's book, The Magic Climber Book, when, when I was 11, believe it or not. And I, I did one of the spells in it, and guess what, it worked. And it terrified the shite out of me. And it made me terrified of magic for years. Really frightened because of that. Not only did it work, it worked perfectly. Now, and then, then again as a teenager, dabbling again, getting great results, terrified, this kind of thing. Until, basically, you develop a kind of maturity, and it's like, it's kind of like getting the, the, the nerve book to ask a girl up to dance. You get the nerve book to like understand and work on magic more. Then I read Michael Talbot's book on quantum physics, and that started to fuse things together. So why there's this kind of a psychic, there's this kind of a, psych, a scientific underpinning here we can work with. It's not just pure. You know, I come from Ireland, the country that's been ripped in two by religion, and I have a, a very healthy dislike for religion. So anything. You see, like anything to me supernatural, it always comes with a kind of a, ooh, transubstantiation, ooh, you know, the, the cat, you know, like this kind of idea. And so I decided to write my first book on sorcery, The Invocation of Strangeness, when standing on a septic tank in a town in Ireland called Chum that had the bodies of 800 babies in it that had been thrown in there by nuns. And the reason why they were thrown in there by nuns was because they could not sell them on the adoption market. They were kids who were not pretty enough, not the stereotypical Irish colleen or the cute little Irish boy. They could sell for fast money to Irish Americans. They neglected them, and between 1927 and 1959, 800 of them died of neglect and were just thrown in a septic tank. And I said, well, what you know what this mean but more important than anything else i had an overwhelming sense of evil and shock standing in this place i could not fathom it and on top of the children's playground is a uh, sorry on top of the children's grave is a playground where children play and it's something terribly depressing about this council estate where it is it's ravaged with drugs and all kinds of social problems 
And it made me realise, well, okay, you have sacred landscapes, you also have unsacred landscapes. You have the shadow and the light. And so I've always been a, a phenomenal uh, fan of literature. I, and we'll talk about this later as the night goes on. Uh, everything from James Joyce to H.P. Lovecraft. And I realised that basically we are suspended in a sea of sorcery. There's very, other, our conscious exists to create this five sense reality, which for many of you notice this already. It's, uh, it's malleable, it's flexible, but the reality is it's almost like sorcery is the way to hack the universe. And until recent times, it's, and it's, for some reason it's really kicking off again now. It's, you have a, very, a mainstream interest in magic, a lot of scientific programs and tests going into it. It's almost like the antidote, the shadow of the, the materialistic world, the Richard Dawkins, the Brian Coxes, is now reversing. And people are interested in sorcery and magic and the idea of the occult and what it means. Now, when I told people I was going to write a book on magic and the occult and sorcery, they said to me, does it work? And I said, of course it works, absolutely it works. And they were saying things like, well, is it like the usual things? It's like Harry Potter, Abracadabra, and you get a new, or this kind of thing, or you say a quick spell and it instantly happens. And I said, no, it's the most interesting process. It's almost like, it's almost like making a pot of clay, baking it in the oven, uh, or having a seed grow. It takes time. It doesn't happen overnight. And this is the difference between how magic was stereotypically presented compared to how it actually really is. And just, uh, you know, I've been keeping notes and eventually that book was in the, it was in the works, should we say. And uh, I wrote a book called The Druid Code because I have a great love of Irish mythology and megaliths. Although I know that the Druids had nothing to do with the megaliths, they were thousands of years later, the book itself was uh, an attempt to use Irish mythology which had survived to kind of find an, a conduit to a proto-shamanic European indigenous magical system that had been destroyed by the Catholic Church mainly. And so that book was a great experience for me. And there was two things, that, there was one thing mentioned in that book and one thing mentioned in my new book that confirmed to me how sorcery actually and magic actually worked. At the, in 2012, uh, 2012 in the oldest house in Dublin, number 9 and 9A, Angier Street in the city centre, the two of the oldest houses, they were bought by the council and they were re 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 uh, rebuilt into, renovated into, like, museum houses kind of thing. Well, they, were, they did dendrochronology tests on the beams, and when they opened the floorboards and the walls, they found witch marks on the, what they call witch marks, a patriopathic magic on the beams, as well as a child's single shoe and a lamb bone. Nobody knew what this meant at the time until someone from Trinity College who actually studied folk tradition said <coughs> that the lamb bone, the single ch infant shoe, and as well as these what they call the witch marks, uh, inverted Ds and M shapes, were used to ward off evil spirits. And courses were particularly malicious intent by individuals. Now this was done around 16... 60, when the Puritans had a lot of power in Ireland, so it was the height of the Puritanical age, where basically, if you weren't a Puritan, you were basically a witch. So even Catholics were living in fear, and even other branches of Presbyterians were living in fear. At the same time that that was discovered, at exactly the same moment, north of the city was a large Neolithic and Bronze Age megalithic landscape of circle and circular enclosures had been unearthed at almost the same time, the same day. And they had been, it's, you know, in Ireland we do not mess with our fairy forts. The Irish people will go to extreme lengths not to, I'll talk about this a little bit more later on, to go near, and even educated atheistic people won't do it. Uh, why? Because they, you get the, if you really ask them, they're terrified. Now, this landscape had been, how such a large <coughs> Neolithic antiquarian landscape had been unknown 
until they were starting to build this development. It's a very unusual arm because they're not usually destroyed, they're usually still intact. Puritans had to have the land and they had plowed it over. They were removing the devil's landscape. Right? And then when the builders came back 400 years later, the ancient Neolithic Druidic and Proto Shamanic people had emerged again. And the same thing across the city in the house. Where, the, where the, the witch marks were found, and did it probably by Catholics to defend themselves from the pre, from the Puritans, had emerged. Now, where are the Puritans? They don't exist. There's no Puritan, not one single Puritan left today. And the Puritans made it a point to destroy anything that was idolatry, anything that was superstitious, anything that was folk, folk related. But yet. The landscape of the Druids and the Proto-Shamanic people of the Bronze Age, Iron Age, and Neolithic Age had emerged from the ground again. They had come back. Those people had come back. And the same with the house when they did dendrochronology. So the, the magic had survived the whole period of time where the Puritans did that. Come, arose, discovered America. These amazing powers. English Revolution, Civil War, Oliver Cromwell and then they're gone. And that proved that the magic of the ancestors was far more powerful than the magic of, well, we don't call it magic, they wouldn't call it, but the, 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 source, the, the, the dogmatic sorcery, the default sorcery of the Puritans. And that's, that to me was very extremely powerful, because it, it demonstrated certain things that if you do have a magical, a magical awareness of yourself and who you are, it, it lasts forever. If you have a dogmatic religious one, it doesn't. It dies with the religion. And this is probably why Catholicism has lasted so well, because basically it's paganism. And just about everything, like this, the, everything, and particularly the post, I'm sorry, the pre-Tridentine Catholicism of before Vatican II in the late 60s, that was where they had the Latin Mass and so on, that was basically European paganism converted to Christianity. We all know that's why we have all the pagan days like Easter and so on are all basically now Christianity and December 24th. Mitraism mm -hmm. is very big. So even the Catholic Church with all its power and with all its ability still can't get rid of magic and sorcery from the pagans. Now this is powerful stuff. It gets even better. And this is just only the examples I know. In, at the end of the, the 1900s, in uh, Loch Foyle, on the banks of Loch Foyle, uh, in County Derry, which is now in Northern Ireland, a farmer dug up a golden boat, and uh, basically a gold hoard. It was called the Brighter Hoard. And it was a gold boat that had been put there by the, by the Druids in the Iron Age as a boat offering to the Irish sea god MacManaman MacLear. MacManaman was which is what the Isle of Man is named after. He was a Celtic sea god. At the moment he was being resurrected, the Gaelic movement in Ireland began. Now, the Gaelic movement was an amazing thing. It was basically, in 18, 1880, almost no one spoke Irish anymore in Ireland. The country had become very English through the empire, and the education system was run from here and so on, so people had lost their language, and there was a small number of people, interestingly all Protestants, Anglo-Irish Protestants by the way, who said, just like what's happened in Cornwall, just like what's happened in Manx, where the culture, they said we've got to find a way to make the, 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 the Gaelic culture not vanish off the face of the earth. So what they did was, they wrote books of the ancient Irish mythology and legends, and it immediately tapped into the, the subconscious of the people, because this is what it's aimed at. Anyone who's read like Joseph Campbell's A Hero of a Thousand Faces, or any of the Jungian books like Man and the Symbols, mythology lives in the subconscious mind. It lives there, and it's almost like it's it's almost like a, a radar that's waiting to pick up a signal. And every human being has it until they're exposed to a certain archetype that may be racially or culturally embedded within them. It switches on. And the, in, the, the, the subconscious mind immediately says, wow, this means something. This is important. And they basically overnight, people like the poet William Butler Yeats and Lady Gregory was another one. They were all 
Anglo-Irish aristocrats, it's most amazing thing about it, resurrected Irish mythology and language to the point where I think by 1926 there were 60,000 Irish books a year being published. And these are just a handful of people. At the time these guys got together at the Gaelic League start, that gold boat was found. It was the boat of the Druids had made a vote of offering, buried it in the sand, two and a half, maybe two and maybe three thousand years, three thousand years later, it comes out at just the right time. But it's even politically interesting, because at the time it came out, a guy called Edward Carson, who was a, an, an extreme orange man, and also the, uh, the, the man who created Northern Ireland, he was responsible for Northern Ireland not to be staying in the UK, he wanted that boat to stay in Ireland because he said it was not because the, the British Museum immediately wanted the gold boat. It was just an incredible art, art, artifact, and he used his power in Parliament. He was an MP, and he successfully lobbied, lobbied Queen Queen Victoria and other people in the civil service and in the British Museum. It really belongs in Ireland, and it, it's still to this day in the in the museum, uh, National Museum of Ireland in Dublin, which is ironic too because he put it in the, the museum of the country he rejected. So, but it's in there, and it's, it's in the museum. Now, so it was almost like those Druids had planted the seed of their own resurrection 3,000 years later. You just think about that. The timing is bizarre, but it was bang on. It gets even better. What, near where the boat was found, there was a... Someone, uh, when the Good Friday Agreement had happened and they basically stopped the <coughs> troubles in North Ireland and this kind of thing, they decided to put a statue of the sea god MacManaman MacLear, they had the pagan sea god, on top of the mountain where it, uh, just behind it. And so, no, and to this day, it's a very popular thing to photograph in against the Northern Lights. The statue is standing on a boat he controls with his, with his, through the waves with his mind. And Whenever the Northern Lights come out, it's a very popular photograph of people who get up the mountain and get him silhouetted against the Northern Lights. You had a literal resurrection of a magical pagan god. And all these processes put it together to make it happen. Now, to me, that was just, that's how you, you see the world in a kind of a magical insight. You, you realize that the power of magic. A couple of Druids buried a gold boat and it actually resurrected at the right time in the history of the country 3,000 years later. And the god is now part of life. It's now one of the most, you know, a, a pagan god, remember. The Catholic Church, the Protestant Church, Christianity could not get rid of it. So now people are worshipping a pagan god. And it's only because of the magical power of that, that, that archetype. And the, the connection with the cosmos, the, this, the northern lights and so on. And that's what really inspired me to finally start writing books about it, because I was like, you know, had a wry smile watching these things going on, and thinking to myself, you see, it, it, it will last, magic lasts. There was also other things too, while visiting megalithic sites. In Ireland, most of our megalithic sites are dead. They're dead. Uh, and coming over here to places like Avebury, uh, they're like, they're on fire with energy. They're on Avebury is on fire. There's something about it. You feel almost like electric bolts jumping out of it. That kind of thing. It's because people love it and have a certain respect for it. And then that was another revelation. It was like, why does it have that way? Well, you see the people that go to Avebury, they're everything from like New Age folks to Wiccan people to people that don't particularly have any, any particular path. But there's a sense of veneration for that. And it's, that's what charges the stones. That's what brings them to life. The, whether it's the quartz in it, I'm not completely sure. I have a good hunch it probably is. But they they seem to respond to the, the love that they're given. They seem to be repositories of that. In Ireland, I'd say look, our most famous sacred site is the Hill of Tara. The Hill of Tara is probably the only place in Europe where you can actually show a ceremonial structure from Neolithic times to, to the present. Although it's been Catholic for a couple of hundred years, well, since the since the middle, since the Renaissance, but 
it's a place where you can actually draw a line back in ancient time. It, it's an awful place. It's a toxic place, and it was the seat of the Irish kings. Why? It was in 1798 a battle was fought on it, and uh, the prisoners, maybe about 20,000 of them, were, were, were killed, buried under the, under the hill, and then the Leofal, which is a stone, the sacred stone that was supposed to be brought to Ireland by the two of the Damon, which was like a mystical race, was deliberately picked up and moved and put on top of their mass grave. Almost like the final desecration. It was, it was almost like a symbolic uh, staking of the, of, the, of the place. And that's and even to this day, when I go up there, it's, it's not a happy place. It attracts a lot, a lot of like the dark kind of social element. You had a group called the British Israelites who had this notion that these islands were really the Holy Land. And in 1904, an awful group actually, uh, they believed that this was the, the Middle East or something. And in order to prove it, they started to find out, they started to say, like, well, Tara was this place and Edinburgh was Bristol, was this, Sodom and Gomorrah and so on. These ideas. They went to Tara with a bunch of shovels looking for the Ark of the Covenant and destroyed the place. Even archaeologically, you cannot find things down there. It's been destroyed by Christians. And it's like there was something in eight within these dogmatic Christians that wanted to destroy Tara. But still, it will come back somehow, and some, some way it will come back. And the thing is, magic, sorcery is the reason why. You can call it whatever you want, energy forces, whatever, but it impacts upon it. Also, during this period, uh, looking at the megaliths, uh, there were certain places I visited where I was literally having psychedelic experiences, both good and bad, without actually taking psychedelics. There was, I was overcome very deeply emotionally on both levels in certain places. One of them was the hypogeum of Hal Sapolini in Malta. I don't know if you know about this place, but you basically walk down a street in a, in a town in Malta, you go on the door, and underneath you is a 5,000-year-old city, hollowed out the rock. It should be the 5,000 years, and its architecture is stunning. It shows Roman and Greek classical style architecture from, five, from the Neolithic period, at least, at least. So way before Rome and Greece ever, and even Egypt existed, people in Malta were doing this under the ground. But you, when you went down there, I had, I felt like I was falling onto another reality. It was, it was quite a remarkable and incredible. And it's the point. It's even though it's a UNESCO World Heritage Site, they don't like people visiting it. So it's really, it's tickets have a waiting list. And I got in. I was lucky I even got in because of part of the film crew. We were doing a documentary on megaliths, and I was in the film crew. I was probably one of the presenters, so I got into that. And. The tour guide, the so-called archaeology, the expert, said this is a place where they slaughtered people, where they murdered them, where they had mass sacrifice, where, you know, ancient people killed, stabbed, cut, murdered. You know, there's the usual places of death. You never know, they're always tombs. And even as a little kid, I knew that that was a lie. <laughs> like, when we were in school, they took us to Newgrange, which is sort of like Ireland, Stonehenge, the Boyle, the Boyle Valley remarkable mound that on the, the winter solstice the, the sun shines straight through a tiny crevice and hits at uh, the back of the chamber. It's the most remarkable thing. Now they only have the rich and famous in it. Ordinary people take a minute. When I was 10, they took us to see that. And they took us there and they took us to another place called Nout, a 5,000 year old incredible Neolithic artwork of carbon. And it blew my mind as a little kid. Then they took us to see the head of a Catholic saint in a box. In, you know, in, Saint, in the cathedral in Drogheda, you have the head, the, sec, the severed head of St. Oliver Plunkett in a glass box in the church. And we were taken to see it, and it was like, you want to be traumatized. That's, there's his head, though. He's perfectly preserved, you know, and he looks like he's been dipped in plaster, and, you know, and the kids are all traumatized. And the next day in school, the teacher is going on about, Oh, Oliver Plunker was a great man. He died for Ireland and he died for the Catholic Church. And I put my hand up and said, uh, Sir, can we talk about the, the new branch? I want to know more about that. And he says, Oh, that was just a place where they worshipped death. 
was not the church where they worshipped the heaven. This was the irony. So as a little kid, it was kind of like one of those moments that wakes you up. And so I have a very healthy dislike for religion. I mean, to the point where I should be like in, I should be like a Richard Dawkins type, but I won't. I have not thrown the, the baby out with the bathwater because it's two different things. And that's that's what I'm. I have so many friends in Ireland who have totally turned against religion in a very kind of almost oh, extremely hostile way, totally understandable. But I'm trying to not get them to throw the baby out with the bathwater to understand that. Well, there's a reason why religion exists. It's not just a map to control people. There's also a very real spiritual, spiritual underpinning below that that led to the creation of religion. It didn't just come from nowhere. It wasn't just that someone said one day, let's find a way to control people through religion. It was a, it was a stolen thing. Now, I've got another book out at the moment that's just come out on the, the, the round towers of Ireland. We have these mysterious round towers all over Ireland. Uh, and we were told when we were kids that they were built by the Christians. They weren't. They're much older. The Christians modified them by putting cones and domes on top to make them look like bell towers, and they put like all kinds of carvings on them. But when you start digging into them, you find things like ancient shield and the gigs. That a, a shield and the gig is actually—I don't know if you know about this—a shield and the gig is a female figure. My friend Jack Roberts and I wrote a very published a very good book about them. But they're, they're all in Ireland. They say the ones into some in England, but they're not actually. When you look into them, it, they're, they're actually gargoyles. That, but they're probably based on the shield and the gigs in Ireland. It's a woman holding her vagina open and make, usually making a face. I think it's a, uh, there's been all kinds of theories uh, associated with them. You know, it's the, the Christians are making fun of the female, like, the, say, female pagan goddesses like Reed, to it was a veneration of pagan, pagan goddesses goddess worship that made it into Christianity. Quite possible, quite possible. I also think there's, I don't, there's also, I think it's, I think it's actually uh, warding off the evil eye. I think <laughs> you see the shape, the way they draw the large vagina, it's very similar to the patriopathic magic and the evil eye, that shape. It's just turned sideways, but it's almost like, these people are artists, so they would, they stylize things and they build things, but that's just my theory, I could be wrong. But the, the round towers, we were told, the lies we were told in school, that the reason why the doors are off the ground was because if the Vikings came, the monks would scurry up there where a ladder and all their books and jewellery and gold. And then the, uh, they, they were saved from the Vikings. All the Vikings had to do was fight a fire and they would, they would have went up like a flu. So they would have ran out. They would have, but they, they were there. They actually had, there was a man called Philip S. Callahan. He was an American U.S. military radio engineer in World War II who developed a radio system for D-Day. And he was based in Fermanagh in Northern Ireland. And when D-Day happened, he had nothing to do because his job was done. So he spent the rest of the war and the, and the rest of his life in Ireland studying the Round Towers. And he was the one that discovered that rock has this thing called a paramagnetic ability. It actually records memories. And he showed that these things were probably some kind of machine to venerate agriculture, but they were also phallic symbols. They were penises. And the, that's what the Christians did. They took the original thing was a dome. And they had a dome on the top. The Christians were neurotic about that. They took it off and replaced it with a, a church spire. And beside them you always had a, a whole, what they call a holy well, which was the female. So you had the, the phallus, the vagina, and then that's why these places all became Christian sites of worship, because they, the Christians just moved in. Some of them are ridiculous. Like every single round tower is freestanding. They're all freestanding. And they've actually tried to even graft them onto churches to say, oh, look, well, we built this. We built this. This kind of nonsense, you know. They built those religious sites there because they were pagan druidic sites dedicated to the last two gods of Ireland, the Crom Cruach, which is a male fertility god, and Bridget, the female, say Bridget, the male horse named Bridget, and they turned Crom into a giant worm. Now the giant worm is around towers, obviously. They, they had, these early Christians had a, an incredible neuroses about the penis and the sexual thing. And you still have, and there's, there's also, there's always a fertility cult. Now, we have fertility problems today. Our ancestors had no fertility problems. 
my grandmother had 16 children. There was no, this is a new thing. They, they just imposed that on the past. People who were perfectly healthy back then. These were a combination, and this is magic now, a combination of art and science to cause change in the material world. They, the round towers had some kind of effect on the agriculture. To this day, Irish farmers move their cattle underneath the round towers to eat the grass because they have healthier yields of, of, of milk and also the animals are much healthier. And the animals desire it. They want to go eat there. There's even a case of an island, Devonish Island, with a beautiful round tower in northern these kinds of impressionist ideas to the post-impressionist, basic one brush stroke, this kind of, I'm creating the most like, beautiful paintings that you could ever imagine. Uh, I mean, I, when I first saw uh, crows in a cornfield, I wept and I, I just thought, didn't understand why, but what I was seeing was something that was incredibly real. But because he, he was almost like a, a shaman who was sacrificed to the world, William Blake's brother, they don't particularly, they're almost like, they, it's a, almost like a Dionysian thing, that they, they, they give us our real gifts to the world and destroy themselves in the process. I often wonder if, uh, if that's the point. If that's the point, it's like we, we know that art has a bizarre way of actually predicting the future. There's been countless everything that's seen things, glimpses of the future. Like nine, I did a talk recently in, in Milton Keynes at a conference there. Uh, the 9-11 event was seen by numerous artists and met many other things beforehand. Incre I, mean, I showed you some of the things you wouldn't believe it. You know, like pe the actual attacks as they looked on the cover of album covers that were supposed to be released on the day. And it was just artists in the concentrated process. Incredible. There's all the famous 9-11 where, <coughs> where Bart Simpson's holding up the bus ticket. Did you ever see that one? And he's holding up bus t cheap bus tickets to New York, and it has nine, and the eleven is the Twin Towers. And it's uh, it, there's, there's tons of things. And, and as it got closer to the date, these things became. There was one band called Dream Theater, and the album had a title like "On Fire in New York City," and it showed a big apple in the middle of it, and the apple is in flames, and there's the Twin Towers, and inside the apple in flames, the album was. The, guess what the date of the album was released? September 11, 2001. These are the kind of shamanic prophecies, the seer kind of idea that artists are able to do, because art is a form of, of natural magic. The concentrated process of being in there and allowing the muse or the daemon, or the genius as the Greeks called it, to work through you to transcend space-time is what makes these art, and that's why you have Van Gogh painting quantum theory a, a decade before it arrived. It's why you have Lovecraft discovering the planet Pluto, by the way, in one of his books. And when it was discovered, he said, oh, that was probably me. And not only did he discover it, but it looks exactly like when the New Horizons spaceship got there in 2014, the photographs it sent back of Pluto were exactly as how Lovecraft described it. It was not uh, just a ball of ice. It had a complex surface with volcanoes all over it. But these, this is amazing stuff when you start to think about it. You can, at some point, you remove the chance of uh, coincidence. And so you see, this is one of the things I've always had a problem with ceremonial magic. I'm not, I like ceremonial magic. I don't do it, but I understand why it exists. Ceremonial magic, as you know it from like the Victorian era on, was probably a way of generating energetic forces through the actual concentration and the intensity of the rite itself. You know, if you have a dagger, the dagger is quite frightening in the hand of someone doing a particular ritual. You know, there's something about the raw blade. So it puts you into a state of hypervigilance. It's done in darkness with a candle. Well, magic has changed since then, because energy is much more abundant than it was then. You look at the, you look at the power that you have in your mobile device, your iPhone or your Android. Realistically, you have more power than the British Empire did as people in your pocket. You think about that. You have more power in your mobile device, so energy is everywhere. 
the therefore magic is far more accessible because energy, the energy needed to hack the operating system of the universe is accessible like never before. Even things like rock music. You know, when I was first doing sigils, I used to go to death metal. You know, I love I love death and dark metal. And I love punk as well. And, God, and I used to go to the mosh pit when I could still do it. And I used to carry the sigil inside me just to charge it. Now, the Victorians would have had a complex ritual that we did in the Golden Dawn or whatever. But this en that energy wasn't available back then. Another one was a roller coaster. I, I used to go to a roller coaster in New Jersey with the sigil. And as everyone was screaming, I would just like look at it and concentrate into it. And that was the, the energy. They didn't have roller coasters in the Victorian times. But they did have things like battles. And that's why they had all these talismans and all these medals and all these kinds of things they would carry with them. These totems, they would even mark them on the gun stock of their rifle. So they would, but that was only available to people who served in the military, that level of sheer intensity. Now you can get a rock concert at fairground, you can get a playing video games for God's sake. So magic is actually more accessible to the population as a whole than it probably ever has been. Because energy, the energy required in order to, to hack the operating software of the universe is there in abundance. It's much easier. I remember when I was about, I was, I was a young kid, 13 or 14, the, you, the TV show Arena, I think it was on the BBC, did a, a, a special on David Bowie's Cracked Actor Tour of America. And it was the first time I'd seen cut-ups. You know what cut-ups are, where you round up and write words on a piece of paper, and then you cut them up into a thing, and then you cut them out, and he was wrote, using it to write lyrics, then he said he'd learned it from William S. Burroughs, who himself was a magician as well, a writer, the writer William S. Burroughs. And I started messing with that. And again, within no time, it was, it was things were happening. It was senses, sentences that made no sense at all in terms of what they meant when they appeared at the time would be resolved in real time later down the road in the most perfect way, not even random happenstance, vague coincidence. I mean, literally, you know, a, a, a series of random words may spell out a world event in the same way a dream might spell out a world event to someone. At the time, because your subconscious mind is much older than your conscious mind, it deals in allegory and symbols, metaphors and shapes. So it speaks to you through dreams, almost like very theatrical things. And you have these series of dreams, and you write them down, what the hell did that? That's just bizarre. And the next, that's another thing, if you keep dream journals, don't try to decipher the next morning. Let them run for a few months and then look back over the book. But they, they, they manifest, and then you, then you say, something happens in your life. And there in perfect allegory was what, what, was, what had taken place months before in the dream because the, the subconscious mind can talk to you in a literal sense in English or any other language, but it can convey it to you in a kind of a theatrical way, in a dream. It's, almost, it's, it's a beautiful thing, when you, it's a very beautiful thing when you think about it. This compression of energy is also there as well. Like, uh, for instance, like someone say, give me a quick demonstration of magic. Okay, you want a quick demonstration of magic? Go text your wife. I've left you for another woman. <laughs> I've left you for another man. Even better. I've left you for a man. Even better. Of course they don't do it. But I said, well, how is that magic? By typing a few little words onto a little dev handheld device and sending it to that person, those handful of letters would destroy everything she represented. And that's, a, that's magic. That's a very basic understanding of it. The consciousness would be immediately affected. Now, again, but, you know, you can fall, you know, years ago, you had the troubadours, the troubadours of the Cathars. If somebody, some uh, European aristocrat, or anybody wanted to meet the girl, he had, he had a crush on the girl in, in down the village, he would be writing sonnets and love poems and sending the troubadours down, paying them, in the hope that she, you know, sent him a, a flower or something. 
Well, now I know people have had very happy relationships when they first saw their photograph of someone on Facebook or on the internet. It's that's uh, and they would just crack a joke on Facebook or tell us something, and she would have noticed him and say, "Oh, I, I kind of had a crush on you from the moment I read that joke." And see, that's magic again. They ch- and then he has a wife, marries her, she becomes, they have kids, and reality has changed. That would have never been changed if he didn't have the mobile device. Donald Trump, for all his faults, uses Twitter like a magic wand. I don't care if you hate him or you love him. It's the funniest thing in the world. I have friends who literally go into convulsions when he posts a tweet. And it is and he knows exactly what he's doing. He knows what and and I'm telling them, don't be watching them. If it really upsets you that much, don't be hanging on to his uh is every tweet so you can be offended by it. They're still down. So somebody that he that he works with has told him this technique, has shown him how to do this, and it's like it's 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 the funniest thing in the world. I mean I have one friend who I thought was quite sane and balanced and well he is sane but balanced and rational. He literally waits, gets up in the morning and he waits for Donald Trump's latest tweet. And no matter how many times I tell him you're, if that's if that's if you want to know what black magic is, you're hexing yourself. Just walk away, and then Trump will post something, anything, and, you know, like and he, and he deliberately what riles them up. You can see it today. You know, on the field, he'll, he'll actually post things like, you know, I, I today we increase so many jobs, greatest president ever, and he's doing it as a laugh. <laughs> and there, can you believe he called himself <laughs> greatest? This kind of thing. And he's doing it so he's making these he's making these people more and more rational, and ultimately he's feeding his power. So he's abs- he's been trained by somebody. He's got someone in his inner circle. I mean, I noticed that right away when he was running for office. This guy is using language in a way that, like a sorcerer, would use it. He's definitely got someone advising him, and uh, it's and uh, and then you have this like quantum entanglement between them. The, uh, the magician and the victim, well, not say the victim, the target. And they're perfect. And I said, just stop. Just stop. And they can't. They cannot stop. It's the funny, it's the strangest thing. Highly intelligent, decent people. All they have to do is remove them from the Twitter feed. It's, it's almost like they want it. It's almost like a kind of an SM, sadomasochistic thing that hits them here, and they want it. It's almost like the, the, the oppressor becomes your, your daddy a, a, after a while. That's, this is interest, this is this is stuff that manifests all around us and we see it. And I, I wrote a book called The Amble of the Psyche and I showed how this kind of idea is used in broadcasting. News reports, news stations all over the world start the same way. They start with dramatic, terrifying music. Dun, dun, dun. Remember when Trevor McDonald news at 10? Darn, unemployment is up by 6 million percent. Darn, 400 people died of hepatitis C. Darn, there'll be no more jobs next year. Darn, you're screwed. And as that, that deeper and deeper and deeper, and then he appears, here's some of the news, that's the same everywhere, you all have their own techniques. And then the, the, the magician, the newsreader appears, and he, he goes through the news, and but then as you're coming towards the end of the news, it's getting lighter. Now the sports results. Oh, your team won. Life isn't so shit after all. And then they finish with a happy social story. Oh, they had a wonderful flower parade in some town. And then you're like, <sighs> the idea at the beginning of that is the, the hypervigilance. You, the the darn, that's to warn you something bad is happening. Like in, in World War II, it was the air raid siren. The modern psychological version of that. The norepinephrine, the back of your, your, your brain, suddenly. Remember, it's just a noise and a picture of Big Ben. It's not someone kicking in your door holding a machine gun. It's something that's in your living room. Doring, norepinephrine in the back of your brain. Floods your bro- lower brain stem. Your eyes open wider. Your face, your head, uh, hypervigilance. Your blood pressure increases. The actual lacti- your nervous system extends beyond the body. You're actually being brought to a place where you're not supposed to be. Why? Darn, that's enough. And that increases. And as that goes on, 
the news gets better. Watch your news. Always. Well, it's not so much down to 24 hour news, but it gets better and better until the, the, the story at the end will have a flood of adrenaline. And that replaced them by, in women, the hormone oxytocin. And in men, they, they reach the, the blood pressure reduces. So the new, and then, but then what happens is you become addicted to these rushes. So you watch the news at 1, 6, or 10 every night. And these are the real, so this is like Alan Moore has said, we do have all the magic in the world today, but it's in the hands of the wrong people. It's in the hands of the wrong people. And we're spellbound by these kinds of ideas, this kind of regulated, playing with our hormones, playing with our, con playing with our conscious, and then playing with our version of reality. You know, and, and, and these, have, these have very personally damaging things. Uh, it, you can see how people will live their lives according to the news, and also the weather. People think the weatherman makes the weather. You know, uh, this, this is a power over your, you've forgotten the power of nature, you've forgotten the power of the seasons, you've handed over to a, a man or a woman who reads the weather. This is black magic. This is black magic in its purest form. You have, uh, you know, even voting, you will, I know, you know, like the, I gave up voting after I realized it was a scam. You have every savior comes along, I promise to do this, I promise to do that. You vote for these guys and they, re they backtrack on every single one, and then the next one comes along, they'll do it again. It's just, it's, it's just like, because it plays on our emotions and our, and our need to be decent, our need to be, our need to believe that there's, that there's altruism is everywhere, and ultimately a hero will ride in at the end of the day. It's all, the, it's all designed to take away from the fact that you're the hero. You're the one that actually ultimately creates create your own destiny. In ancient Rome, the very, first, the very first steam engine ever made. The ancient Romans invented a steam engine. So what do they say? What can we do with this? What can we do with this steam engine? Can we make a transportation system? Can we use it to power a machine to pump water? No. Nope. They invented a way to open the doors of a temple so you would believe that God was appearing. And they would use it to control the people. And the, the doors, the, when the steam engines come on, the steam would fill around the door, and the doors would open slowly by the steam engine, and everyone would, ah, oh, Jupiter is here. And as the steam engine on the springs, on the cams, reduced the pressure, the doors closed again. See, they're, they're the ones using magic against us. They're the ones using sorcery against us. And this is, this is how it's done. This is how it's done. Now, There's also an element that not everyone should do it. A lot of traditional cultures, particularly, you know, I know downstairs, it's just astounding that the exhibits downstairs are beautiful. And you see how rich and intense folk magic was in Cornwall. It was everywhere, everywhere. And in a society that's, that's declining or in danger, people will start, now this is, I have a chapter in my book saying you should never curse anyone. Never course anyone, because, the, I mean, I've, I've got countless books that I've collected over the years, quite antiquarian books on magic, and they all, <coughs> the ones that have any credibility say the same things, don't course people, just don't do it, you can ha even, and if you have to do it, do it on your deathbed, do it on your deathbed, because the idea of rebound or blowback is almost certain, even if the person served it, it's really dodgy, because you might pass that course on to the future generations. So the bottom line with me was always, but whoever is still interesting, it's still an interesting, still, there's a ways around them, which I described in the book, where you sort of, you create a kind of a shimmer or a mirage of the person you're targeting, and you curse that without naming it, that way it, it comes back, it doesn't come back looking for you. So, uh, in, in Ireland, right before the famine happened, there was epidemic cursing in rural Ireland. In one half a town or one family would be coursing, it's not just only an arm, but it reached an industrial scale. Until what? The, the potato crop failed, a blight appeared, and everyone was wiped out. The course came through for everyone. They are, they are, they, you know, the idea you believe that your course would be the one that will save you. And uh, you know, there's, there's even the, a book that was written by a, a Catholic bishop in Ireland <coughs> suggested 
suggested in a kind of a psychological, sociological way that maybe all the coursing left <coughs> meaning that they weren't tendering their farms or anything like that and things went, they became more obsessed with, but reality was the famine was caused by a blight that came out of nowhere, a, a, a very strange obviously, unusually hot summer. And uh, so this is, you could have, this is why you have like in Sicily and in, in Italy, the, the emigration levels were enormous because everyone was coursing everybody else. The only way to break the courses was to go to America, emigrate. And even then, it would fall, the, Pens the, the German witchcraft, the Hexan ones, would actually go to Pennsylvania and continue coursing over there on the other side of the Atlantic. And this is why coursing is very dangerous one to play with. It has an addictive quality, but it's also dangerous. Now, I went to, uh, uh, one of the things in my life that was an amazing experience, I lived in New York for years, was I went to see a, center, a Santeria, uh, a Santeria practitioner go into a shamanic state, and it was, it was nothing like you, I expected. They were getting, they were get, people wanted information about a person who was giving them a hard time. And so, like, there was one woman there, she was Puerto Rican, and her, her daughter was with an abusive boyfriend, and she wanted to get information to somehow tell her Get away from him. He's a bad. He's a bad. He's a bad one. You know, it's a bad one. Uh, this thing was incredible. Uh, this uh, a very normal-looking Puerto Rican lady came in. Very nice lady came in the room, just like any of you in a room about this size, but a number of people comes in. And hello, how are you? All this kind of thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's like pulling my cheek, saying, "Oh, yeah, this kind of thing. Oh, nice Irish boy. This kind of stuff." Sits down in the room. Uh, and goes into a trance, and when she went into the trance, I can guarantee you and it, that the, the temperature <coughs> dropped, the room dropped by several degrees. She came out of the trance and was talking in a masculine voice, very, and very loud, I might add, for the way she was projecting. She immediately demanded cocaine and cigars. This woman didn't touch drugs, and she didn't drink. And there was someone People were giving her cigarettes, someone was giving her had a bottle of whiskey, and she was drinking it down like that. I mean, when I say drinking the whiskey like that, I mean like water on a hot day. And because the demon, this, this demon that she had manned, this entity, comes into human bodies in order to get their hands on human things. And this is how you pay them. And uh, so this is the bargain. And so they want whiskey, they want cocaine, they want drugs, they want cigarettes, they want these are the kind of things they want, cigars. She's the people in the room that I, I couldn't understand because they were talking in Spanish a lot of it. But basically the woman told me afterwards that she asked her what's the story with this boy who's like not good for my daughter. And she said that he has a wife she said she she he has a wife and and two children in Puerto Rico and he's lying about being single. Turns out later, she, she was telling the truth. Because the entities are not subject to the space time. They can move back and forth. And this is back in the time of the cunning people, the cunning folk in London, they would invoke the demon Oberon in order to get information about the past, present, and the past and the future. Because the entities are not, and by the way, these entities are real, they do exist. We call them demons, and we call them fairies. By the way, in Ireland, people are terrified of fairies. I keep, I have to keep telling the Americans particularly that it's not Tinkerbell. Just, Irish people are absolutely terrified of the fairies. They're just none of this kind. That there are little fairy happy friends. An Irish, uh, elderly Irish people will go to extremes to avoid anything connected with the fairies. And so the, ent the, the entities are not subject to the space-time field. Therefore, you can get information in the future. Also, schizophrenics as well can do this, which is just a baby some element of schizophrenia kind of possession. From the future to the past, they're about people. The cunning people, the cunning folk in London used to get information on lost lost things, or, you know, I lost some money, where is it? Or the buried treasure was a very common one. Until recently, an American psychiatrist discovered you could do the same thing with schizophrenics. That you could actually, schizophrenics were telling things like there's a, there's a million dollars in cocaine money buried at the end of this road in a box at the end of the field, about three feet down. And they would say, well, how do you know that? I just do. 
So the scene that's a, that's another thing that's very interesting. Very interesting. I'm not stigmatizing people with mental illness, by the way. I'm just saying this stuff has come to light. So she did that, and when she came through from the trance, this was like one of the most pivotal moments in my life. She had uh, she had drunk. It was a bottle of whiskey about that much. She had guzzled down in an hour that much. Came out completely sober. Completely as sober as she went in. As if it wasn't her that got drunk, but the entity. And that was, and that was, that, that form of Santeria is very commonly practiced by Puerto Ricans living in, in Puerto Rico and America. Why? Because it works. It works. Now, because of the prohibitions on such ideas by the Catholic Church, they incorporate a lot of Christianity. So before the woman appears, she, they'll say, this is done for the Blessed Virgin, this kind of thing, or for St. Anthony, and there'll be holy statues around the room, but it's purely a thing to protect them, like an insurance policy. And the Catholic Church in New York do tolerate it for that reason. These people tend to be quite devout Catholics, but they also practice magic. Interesting. It's, it, it, again, it just shows the thing, because that Catholic Church and magic are, are quite and paganism are very, very closely related, Too pro, more closely related than anyone ever to find out. That's why they were so successful. That's not, there wasn't because suddenly, like in Ireland, suddenly the Druids one day turned around and said, I got a great idea. That's all become Christians. It wasn't like that at all. Now, speaking of the Druids, I, uh, this is another thing. I'm glad, I'm always glad to come to England and written and talk about the Druids. Because you're confronted by two things. You're given the Roman propaganda version of it, written by Julius Caesar and Tony and Tacticus, where the Druids of Gaul were sacrificing people, boring them in wicker men. Remember, these books were written at a time of war. It'd be like expecting George Bush to write a favorable, neutral book about the Taliban. That's what we're dealing with. It was propaganda. And a lot of people over here think there's nothing left of the Druids, but there is in Ireland. There's a vast, vast folklore canon of the Druidry in Ireland. And it's, it's incredible stuff. And how it survived was the Irish Druids saw what happened to the British Druids. The Druid, British Druids were all exterminated in AD 60-61 by Suetonius Polonus, who after the Iceni revolt, sailed across the Mena Straits in Wales and massacred the last of the British Druids in Angles. That had been remembered in Ireland. So what they did was they formed, they, the Druids started pretending to be Christians. St. Kieran was a famous one. Uh, he, he, they're all held as Christian saints, but they infiltrated the early Christian church when they arrived in Ireland. And this is how they managed to survive to, to keep the paganism and the Druidry alive. This is why we have shield and the gigs, they weren't destroyed. This is why we have here, uh, we'll get to in a second. The most famous bunch of these were a group called the Chaldeas. The Chaldeas were a kind of a Druid hybrid group, Christian group. It was in the interest of both the Christian missionaries and the Druids themselves to do business, especially in countries like Ireland and Scotland, which were, might have been the moon to them in those days. They, they, you know, the language was language issues, cultural issues. So the Druids were a very good way of getting in there. And we have a vast amount of very quite credible mythology and stories and folklore on the Druids, so we do know a lot more than people think they do. The Druids were practicing magic, but they were practicing magic in a practical way. Like for instance, St. Patrick didn't actually really exist. Well, if he did, it'd be a miracle. It's the, this, this so-called book of his life is in four fragments. They're about that size, written 800 years after the death of London were in Ireland. <coughs> so it's like it's almost like he never existed. Probably didn't, so it's probably best to call us a, like a, a patrician's crusade. And like they were basically, they invented a story on that, they, they, they invaded in a, in a, in a, the, a theological manner. And they were always complaining about the Druids of Ireland had the power of invisibility. This is a big thing. They were always being frustrated by the Druids and their power of invisibility. And what that means is they were pretending to be. They were pretending to be Christians. And they would 
usually discovered them by how they read poetry. They used to, they were, the bar, they, were, they had a very bardic idea of poetry. And all the early Christian poets, poets were writing about how they were being driven crazy by these, these bards, who spoke in riddles. And what they were doing is they were talking in, ma in a magical kind of language, in a kind of incantations. They were basically driving the Christians insane. But they couldn't actually capture them, because a lot of them were actually in the church too, pretending to be bishops. Anyone could become a bishop in those days. So it's like, you'd have like head, head bishops in Ireland who were like, who were head druids, you know, and they were hiding. And this, this, this is one of the reasons the, the Catholic Church basically threw in the towel and adopted kind of, adopted kind of their own version of paganism. Now another one, the symbol of the crucifix used in Christianity is not a Christian symbol. It's a druidic symbol. I can show you crucifixes that are two and a half thousand years old, where I live in County Sligo in Ireland, that were shaped like the Maltese cross. The early symbol for Christianity was a fish. It's only until the Middle Ages or so that the, the crucifix becomes a popular symbol. So all that artwork that's around these islands that's supposed to be from the Dark Ages, they call it, the early days of Christianity, none of them are Christian because they weren't using the crucifix. The Druids were using the crucifix. The Catholics took it over much, much later. In all Catholic art, you only see the crucifix appearing in the, in the early Middle Ages. Before that, it was nothing but a symbol of the fish. Also, if Romans didn't crucify people like this. They crucified them by tying their hands behind their neck like that on a pole. So you wouldn't have crucified like that. They had to eventually adopt a pagan magical symbol and incorporate it into the center of their, their whole philosophy and their spiritual tradition. So that is... Back to what I was starting at the beginning when I talked about how the pagan magic eventually ended up coming back to the surface again. Well, it even exists in Christianity. The crucifix is a pagan magical symbol. So we even own that. We've even taken that over. It's, it shows the unbelievable tenacity about these ideas and why they've lasted. Why have they lasted? Because they're rooted in the subconscious mind of they're not rooted in the so-called dogmatic consciousness of the of the the conscious mind. They're deeply sequestered and embedded within the body of the person in their subconscious mind. These people, our ancient ancestors, had an understanding of that, and that's what magic really was to them: to deposit ideas inside you, deep inside your being. So you would always relate to them, generation after generation, what you what Jung called the collective unconscious. Now, I've got 10 minutes left. I just want to talk about uh, what I think makes magic work. Yes, there's a psychological component. Yes, there, uh, there's a huge psychological component. Like at the example I gave you of the guy sending the text to his wife saying, I'm having an affair with a man, that's a, a form of psychological magic. But still the same thing, her conscience and her whole life was ultimately altered by it. But how does that explain this something called unconscious plagiarism, where if you put people all together with an expert on a topic, without him actually telling these people on the topic, they know about it. They're picking it up from him. This has actually been scientifically proven several times. In fact, there's even a, there's even many books that have been written far, far apart that contain the same plot. I think Nietzsche and H.P. Lovecraft wrote a story of, uh, that had the same narrative of someone arriving on an island, and uh, a man who was on a flying machine appeared to them. And it was identically described by both Nietzsche in German and Lovecraft in English, but Lovecraft had never ever read Nietzsche, and also, the original story had never been printed in English, and Lovecraft couldn't read German. And it was eventually accepted that they somehow picked it up out of the ether, out of the collective unconscious. Right. Uh, so how does this explain how people can read each other's minds, move things at a distance? You have in the Orient, you have the, like the one punch, the one inch punch that can knock a person down without actually touching them. 
I believe at, at this point, you know, it's, you can invoke quantum forces, and that's a good one. You know, these are just terrible thrown out there. There's definitely an interface between the nervous system and the result. Absolutely. Whereas telekinesis, reading someone's mind, getting a noetic insight, there's definitely some kind of interface. You have the nerve of the brain, the cognition, the nervous system, and then that interfaces with something that gets a message from the other side. Magic. And I'll give you an experience that happened to me. Uh, when I left New York, I had a friend who we had a business together and it collapsed. And we both lost an absolute fortune. And my life savings was wiped out and so was his. It was a, it was a printing business that just failed. I had basically, blamed, in my own mind, had kind of blamed him and kind of myself. I said, why did I ever get into business with that guy? I was, was when I moved back to Ireland, why did I ever get into business with him? Blah, 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 blah. And to the point where I was consuming, like rumination, you know, when, I, when you're only really in love with someone that breaks up and you have to get them, it was, it was like that on the other side. I just couldn't shut it down. And uh, everywhere I'd go, it was like, it didn't matter, it changed nothing. It changed nothing, right? And I'm walking down the street in Dublin one day, and there he is wa walking towards me on the other side of the pavement. And I was, you know, I didn't know what to do, but something told me not to go near him. And he was there as clear as you, any of these people. And I walked right past him, and he didn't make eye contact with me. And that was freaky enough. I thought it was him, and there was something, there was something weird going on. My mind was running away with itself. About seven months later, he called me up, and he says, "You know, Thomas, uh, you know, it's a shame we were, we were really good friends before that happened. And let's be honest, we were both idiots to know what we were doing. And uh, it's a shame, you know, it's a shame that I, you know." And he said, "I used to really, you know, I, I used to blame you, you blamed me, but and I said, you know what, Tony, you're." You know, we're, both of us were at fault, and both of us were innocent. It was kind of a, a nice kind of resolution. And then I said to him, about seven months ago, I forget the date, I said, were you, were you in trouble walking down the street? And he goes, I've never been armed in my life. And I says, you're not going to believe, I says, why did you, why did you say that? And I said, if I told you, you wouldn't believe me. It's just so weird. I, said, I was really thinking about it, and I don't know what I did. And he goes, well, what date was it? I can't remember the date now, I didn't write it down. He says, I was having incredible dreams about you. I'll constantly, really vivid dreams that I was seeing you walking down the street. And uh, that got me really interested. So was I going mad? Was, I have, was it a generated hallucination? And why was he having the same experience at the same time I was in a different way? Well, we were both involved in deep levels of concentration, pain. I was constantly thinking about him in a, in a very emotional way. He was constantly thinking about me in a very emotional way on the other side of the Atlantic, I might add. Then I discovered, you know, the idea of a doppelganger. Well, there's a very, and this is another thing, magic is also seems to be racially or ethnically connected. Each ethnic group seems to have its own kinds of magic. So, I'm walking down the street, and I, this guy's generate. So I found in the, in, the, in the Irish folklore tradition, there's something called a fetch. F-E-T-C-H, like fetch. And it comes from an Irish word called fecha. I don't know what the word is. It's an ancient Irish word. It's a double of a person that you need to forget. Or a double of a person that you have an untoxic toxic relationship with. Or a double of a person that is having malicious thoughts about you. In this case, it was probably all three with this guy. Because we were best friends. And there was like a lot of love there before it fell apart. So it was, every, it was, it was, it was like a perfect storm of everything that could, could go wrong in friendship. And I had I literally generated him in real time on the street walking as a kind of a shimmer or a mirage through sheer will, and this is what the, the old Irish people used to believe, and it meant that you had to do something about it, solve that issue, you know, had a broken heart. 
I know people that broke it up and years later thought they saw their, their ex walking down the street, or died even, even died. I said, I saw them, I, I, um, as clear as day, I saw them weeks later walking down the street. And that was the fetch. Now, what caused that interface? Well, this is just my theory I'm throwing out there. 96% of the universe is missing. It's, it's not here. 96-97% of the universe around us, is, they can't find it. It's lost. And they call it dark matter energy. But they know it has tremendous power. Because how they discovered it was, spiral galaxies were much too big to be held together by the sheer gravitational forces of the stars inside them alone. So some exterior force was pressing on the, these, these galaxies to hold them together. There wasn't enough energy in there to hold them by gravitation. And they developed this idea called dark matter energy. That it is the unseen force of the universe that seems to hold everything together. And it's also the thing where you could have like quantum entanglement where you take a particle, you entangle them with subatomic particles, and take one on to either side of the universe, you move that one a certain way, that will do it at exactly the same time. The interface, I believe, is this dark matter energy. You have your nervous system. Your nervous system is rigged to incredibly heightened states. It pushes on this so-called dark matter energy. And on the other side is where you get the effect. And it's almost like an unseen conduit that it is the kind of like the glue of magic. This is my theory at all. That, <coughs> that glue of magic that glues all these supernatural experiences together. So when you have people like Richard Dawkins, Brian Cox, and other these celebrity scientists are saying, we've nearly discovered everything. Or we're on the point of discovering everything. Remember, most of the universe, they can't even find it. They can't even find it. <coughs> and that's the, that to me is where the, the that, 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 that unknown, unseen space, that dark matter energy, is the conduit between these, what we call, magical experiences. And from the early shamans who were concentrating their their energy, psychic energy, on their fires <laughs> and dancing and drumming, right up to these like sort of technological default magi of the CERN super collider. That's what they're playing with. That's what they're playing with. And I think a lot of them know it, but because reduction of science can't put a finger on it, they can't actually. Like the Roll Right Stone Circle, uh, uh, quickly here in England, and the, the, the New Science magazine went there in 1982 and discovered that there was some kind of force that jumped from stone to stone to stone to stone like a relay and then spiraled, in, this was in the New Scientist now, and then spiraled into the center, went right to the middle of the circle and then vanished out of this universe. Now that was 5,000 years ago that they, they knew this. They didn't have a language for it, they didn't have the theory for it, but what that was was magic. So thanks very much. Mm -hmm.